my name is Michelle Leifer, and I'm the new director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education here at the Animal Medical Center. So tonight's event, which we're super excited about, um, it's the first USDAN lecture focusing on exotic pets. Um, yay. <laughs> um, and you know, one of the many things that's wonder that are wonderful about AMC, but what really sets us apart um, is that our commitment to the compassionate care for all types of animals. Um, AMC established its avian and exotics pet service more than 35 years ago, and it was the first specialty service of that kind in New York City in the metropolitan area. Um, and a fantastic addition to our avian and exotic pet service is tonight's featured speaker, Dr. Latoya Latney. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, Dr. Latney is a board-certified specialist in exotic animals. Before coming to AMC this past June, Dr. Latney was an assistant professor of clinical zoo and exotic medicine and the head of the Exotic Companion Animal Medicine and Surgery Service at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, we're very grateful to have her speaking here tonight. And so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Latoya Latney. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I know there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of letters there. Um, I can explain. Um, part of it is because I realize I look like a toddler. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be trained by very senior people early on in my veterinary career. Um, and so just to make sure that I proved it to people, I sat for all these board exams. So um, I'm a specialist in zoo health medicine through the European College of Zoo Medicine. And um, not that I don't specialize with the other species, but the ones that really, really need help and there's less people involved in that college is the College of um, Reptile and Amphibian Medicine. So um, I, I am a little biased. <laughs> and I can kind of give you guys some, um, some information about why that particular set of animals really, really needs a lot of help. Um, but I see everything that's not a cat or a dog, especially a small dog. I'm terrified of them. All right, so we're gonna start. They're all cute and everything, but like as a person that deals with giant snakes and alligators, the only thing that has consistently maimed me without provocation, <laughs> Jack Russell Terriers. I don't know why. <laughs> they can smell the anxiety off of me. I'm pretty sure it's my fault. But um, I wanted to talk to you guys today about a pretty, I wanna say like challenging topic, not only just for pet owners, but also for veterinarians who may not be as, as experienced with the animals that we're very fortunate to be working with one-on-one -on -one here, and that's for exotic species. Exotics is a big term for everything that is not a cat or a dog. Believe it or not, our pet bunnies, our pet ferrets, domesticated. So I can't even use that as a qualifier anymore to define what an exotic species is. Um, but literally from rabbit to tarantula, we're talking about all of those things, they fit underneath of that category. Um, so the goal for tonight is to talk a little bit about what pain actually is, how it's defined in human medicine, okay? And then we'll talk about the comparative anatomy. Everyone always asks like, what does an exotics vet do? We're comparative anatomy specialists. We need to know how this disease performs in a cat, a bear, a rabbit, and a turtle. And the good news is that all of these guys have very similar machinery to process pain very similarly to the way that we do. So we're gonna talk a little bit about all of the different components. And part of the reason why that's really important is because if you have a painful pet that comes to see a veterinarian, sometimes we'll offer more than one pain medication. Um, and it becomes really important because our goal is to make sure that we're managing different types of pain, which they can experience very much like we can experience. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then we're just gonna very briefly show you where all of the pain medications work in the different parts of the body. All right, so we're gonna define pain, pain physiology. Um, then we're going to talk about how we recognize it in our species. Um, part of this is gonna really, really empower you um, because I've actually done some research regarding validating pain scales for use in animals. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how we do that in animals and also the information that we borrow from human medicine to make sure that when we're really, really making a call on something, we have a way to objectively measure it as a doctor, and you guys feel very comfortable with able, being able to subjectively monitor that at home. This is my 21-year-old crested gecko with her little cataract. Um, I spayed her when she was nine. I have no idea like what my, like the clock meter is. She just likes to watch TV at night. 
Um, so I have to get home by 8 o'clock because she's at the front of the cage and she wants to watch cartoons. And that's usually what she does. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things we're going to talk a little bit about, and it becomes very challenging, um, is that most of these animals that we're dealing with, um, we can't say domesticated versus not. We can call them exotics. Um, they have very, very specific behaviors, right, that's unique to those animals. Um, so you add that, and then you add to the fact that they may develop very specific behaviors at home as your pet. And so always tell owners it becomes really important to feel very, very much like you have agency in calling whether or not you feel like your pet is uncomfortable because you are the experts on your pet's behavior. And that becomes really, really important when the vet has to step in and say, well, here's the types of pain medications we can help with. All right? So first things first, why is it very hard to recognize pain in these species? Literally, and I'm not exaggerating, you have to remember these animals are designed to function in nature, right? They happen to be our pets. Some of them are domesticated, but their brain is designed and wired to how they functioned in the wild. In the wild, a number of the species that we deal with are considered prey animals, okay? Even the ones that you think eat meat, so therefore they shouldn't be prey animals, <laughs> they're prey animals too. So show of hands, anyone have ball pythons? Like people, okay, let's talk about it. Those guys get eaten by other snakes. They also get eaten by chimpanzees. So their literal like whole thing is like, I gotta hide so that I don't get eaten by something else, okay? Even though they eat other animals, they are also in their midbrain, like I have to hide, I don't wanna get eaten. That drive is so conserved in their brain and their physiology that they are designed to hide weakness and illnesses of any sort. In birds, it's like pretty intense. They know they have to hide their illness because if they look sick, then that's kind of like a red alert to any predator that could not only threaten them, but threaten their flock. And so one thing that wild birds do is if they see someone that's in the flock that's sick, they will straight up take that animal out because they do not want to bring attention to the rest of the animals. So when I say these guys are designed in their brain to be really cryptic at hiding their pain and at hiding any types of illness, please understand, if you're coming into us and we happen to see your pet and we're like, we're, we almost are like, like forensic investigators. We're looking at the anatomy to see what they've been hiding from you. Does that make sense? Even though you guys are the experts on their behavior, they also love you. So what are they going to do? I don't want my mommy and daddy to know I'm sick. I'm going to smile. I'm going to crack seeds. I'm not going to eat them, but I'm going to crack them and try to act like everything's normal. So be mindful of that. Most owners are shocked that I'm just like, yeah, she's got adrenal disease. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. Their job is not to advertise to you when they're not feeling well. The reverse is true. They work really hard to hide when they're sick, OK? And they can't control it. It's nothing personal. That's how their brain is built, OK? So first things first, what is pain? This is really important because this is the definition taken from the International Association for the Study of Pain. So this is in terms of evidence like the biggest organization that's able to tell you what true pain is as defined by people. And pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience, okay, associated with actual or potential tissue trauma or injury, which is really, really important. So based on this definition, it says that not only can something physically be painful, it can be emotionally painful too, even if something doesn't touch you, if you perceive that that's going to hurt, that's considered pain as well, okay? It's a pretty hardcore definition, and I, I usually like to go over it because I think our definition for animals is a little bit too simple when we start to compare it to how we define pain in ourselves. And I try to like open it up for more people to like really, really investigate these things because it becomes really important. What else, the other part of the definition, the ability the inability to communicate verbally does not negate the possibility that an individual is experiencing pain. This is very relevant to us, right? Because animals have a behavior, um, have a vocabulary, and it's behavioral. We're very verbal. We use a lot of words. We have a language. We don't always know their language. So our abilities to communicate with each other can be very, very much, you know, kind of butt heads. If you don't know how to talk bird, if you don't know how to talk rabbit, Clearly, rabbits don't know how to talk human primate. Um, it becomes really challenging. So just because they can't show you all of the time doesn't necessarily mean that they're not in pain, just because they don't have our language. And most of the times, we're learning their language. 
There's another term, if you do some research on your own, that's called nociception. And essentially, that's very much, it's very, very like, I want to say the physiologic definition of something, um, like the actual sensory, I want to say the sensory reaction to feeling something that hurts, okay? Even potentially. So that means if you put your hand too close to a hot kettle and you instinctively pull it back, your body, your reflex arcs already knows if I put my hand on that hot plate, it's going to hurt. But you don't have to touch the hot plate to know that it's going to hurt. You're already pulling your hand back, okay? Animals have that capability too. So who has pain? This, I'm telling you right now, this is the trust bubble, right? We can all share. We're all family. This becomes a really big source of contention for some veterinarians. Um, also, in addition to that, to some comparative um, um, physiologists and evolutionary biologists. Our definition is that anything that's a vertebrate that has those receptors, nociceptors is a big word for pain receptors. They come in a couple different flavors, okay? A spine and a brain. If they've got all of those components, they can feel pain. There are some evolutionary biologists that will argue that certain animals do not feel pain. I tell you, for the most part, veterinarians are like, get out of my face. They don't really entertain that argument. We tend to be pretty aggressive about it, and I'm not joking when I say aggressive. We write the guidelines for humane euthanasia, and we're, we like say, look, this is the law. We don't, we're, you're, it's too petty an argument. Here's all of the proof. So um, where those people tend to argue with us, however, is that um, defining that emotional context of pain, uh, defining suffering, um, is, has a very specific part of the brain that does that for us. I call it a coloring book. It colors the experience associated with that pain. And that's the prefrontal cortex. And in us, dolphins, cetaceans like orcas, um, pigs, rats, have very, very well-developed areas there. Some animals don't have as well-developed areas there, but they actually have another part of the brain that works the same way in the same function. Um, and some of these animals have different so we're going to talk a little bit, does different mean no pain? And what I like to do is show people part of the reason that becomes important is because there's different types of pain. Definitely a fish is going to avoid something that is acidic in the water that's causing irritation to the skin. Um, most people will say that's nociception, that's not pain, because it has a different brain than ours. I say it's pain. If it knows to avoid it because it thinks it's harm, then it's, it's pain. Um, and there's different types of pain. There's acute versus chronic pain. So something that happens like I prick my finger on a pin out or like say when I was young, I didn't know any better. I was running in track. I had shin splints. I kept running on them because who tells a teenager to take care of their bodies? And I broke my shin and I had chronic pain associated with the shin splint. But then when I broke my shin, it became real acute real fast, right? <laughs> so to kind of give you some context, there's different types. And then you'll generally see us break things down into these three major categories when we're talking to owners. There's different types of pain, but these are like the biggest ones that we try to focus on um, because they're the ones that are really, really like relatable and you can understand them very um, easily. And most of our pain medications like pretty much cover all of these categories, which is great. So the first one is somatic. Anytime you hear that word, it means muscle, skin, bone. Okay, and it means it's pretty well localized. Like, thunk, I broke my ankle. I feel that. <laughs> the bone's broken. I can feel everything. Then we have visceral pain. And visceral is associated with like internal organs, um, also the brain. So like anytime you have a headache or you have a tummy ache, um, that's associated with that. Notice in those situations, it's usually not like an immediate stabbing pain. Usually it's like a pain that wants to massage every opportunity to let you know that it's there. It's very slow, burning, frustrating. Okay, and then we have neuropathic pain, and neuropathic pain is not fun. Um, neuropathic pain occurs when there's an upregulated up spinal signal that says like, okay, I touched my hand that way, that shouldn't hurt. But say if I had a deep cut there two years ago, and I touched that area, and it feels like I got cut again, even though I'm not cutting myself. That's because my spinal cord remembers, and it did not like that, and it says, we're touching the spot again, we're touching the spot again, code red, code red, code red, and it starts to amplify the signal, okay? But when you see neuro, that means neuron, pathic, bad. That's literally what that word means. So something's causing a lot of nerve pain. 
And the spine is a giant collection of nerves, and it has a lot to do with how we process what pain is when we may start to send the signal up to the brain, okay? So like not to denigrate the amazing pain physiologist that we have in the world, okay? This might be the simplest picture of a very complicated topic, um, but I just wanted to put it in there for reference to kind of give you an idea of how we baseline look at pain. This is how pain moves in the body. And this is true for all the animals we're talking about tonight. This is also true for you, okay? First thing that happens is that a pain receptor goes off. It's like something upsets a pain receptor. Those pain receptors could be just specific for temperature. So like if you burn yourself or if some, you hit something too cold, um, it can be specific for noxious stimuli. So like um, if like an acid, like something chemical hits your skin, it could be if you have a breach in your skin where it's actually like a cut related injury. So there's different types of receptors that respond differently to different types of pain. So that thing gets alerted and it's like, hold on now, something's not quite right. It then sends the signal to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is like, I'm gonna go tell the brain something happened. <laughs> You're like, whoa, now this is happening lightning fast, by the way. <laughs> and then the brain then takes over from there so that you then co you qualify and quantify the experience. So it tells you how much it hurts and it, it tells you like the way in which it hurts. That's what the brain is responsible for. And then one extra step with us mammals, we want to put some emotional flavor on it. Be like, did it make me sad? Was it exciting? Do I ever want to go through this again? All of those things are going on every time something noxious hits you, okay? So the brain does a lot in terms of processing. The brain's not super wimpy. It also has a lot of internal pathways that goes back down to the spinal cord that has instantaneous pain relief, which is really, really, really helpful. So the body's always trying to protect itself. That having been said, when we get up to the brain, the part where we start talking about what pain is, and that is if it's causing suffering, if we're qualifying how intense it is, um, we call that pain perception. And there's three major parts of the brain that kind of work together to qualify that experience for us. The thalamus, which is putting together all of the information that's coming back from the neurons and everything that's coming up from the spinal cord. Then you have the brainstem, which is amazeballs. It's got its own internal pain relief. We have endogenous opioids. Like, we've got endogenous pain relief mechanisms. Um, that's pretty sweet. I'm like, that's awesome. Uh, there's an internal mechanism for this. Um, the brainstem already makes chemicals to tell the rest of the body, hey, I need you to relax. It's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. But then when we travel all the way to the front of the brain, the cortex, that's when we start putting some emotional characterization of what just happened. Okay, and that's what we qualify as pain and suffering. Okay, so everyone always says, and we always have this argument with biologists like, well, what is pain? This is a very rudimentary picture of the different segments of the brain. Super rudimentary. Okay, there's a spinal cord, that's great. We've got the hindbrain, all of this area here, the hindbrain and the midbrain, have our autopilot neurons in there. So the things that let us know we're upright, things that control our breathing, our heart rate, like things we don't have to think about, all of that autopilot stuff is here, very important machinery. Then as we start to move up here, we start, sens we start putting sensory information together. We start going through here, pain mechanisms that are internal start activating. And then this whole situation right here, we start qualifying if we're sad, happy, joyful about the experience, okay? So this part up here is called the prefrontal cortex. This is really important. And it's in the, cere in the cerebrum. And if you take a look, all of these animals have that part of the brain, which is my argument that says, yeah, they can feel pain. They might be able to articulate it the way we would, but like, why are we setting ourselves as a standard? We all have the machinery, so we should assume that they all have the capacity to feel discomfort. So when I have to have like super anatomical discussions about this, I just pull out like, yeah, for pain intensity, we're talking about sensory and discriminative um, pathways. In mammals, this is the places where it lights up in the brain. In reptiles, this is where it lights up. In fish, gorgeous paper that goes over what, where it lights up, okay? Um, then when we talk about suffering, because again, this is all that cortex processing everything that's happened, motivational effective dimension of pain. In mammals, it's the limbic cortex, and that includes the amygdala. In fish and reptiles, it's something, well, in fish, it's the um, uh, medial pallium and the archipallium. 
And then in reptiles, it's the basal lateral amygdala and sometimes a posterior dorsal ventral ventri ventricular ridge. So this is a lot of um, big words, but when I have to have these arguments, when I'm writing book chapters and things like that to tell other people, hey, look, wake up, these animals feel pain, this is the argument I throw at them. We have so much information, like so much information about how these animals work. Unfortunately, that information is not always tucked conveniently in a veterinary textbook for us because we deal with so many species. So we end up having to look at a lot of literature and a lot of evidence to be able to validate these arguments. If you guys, I'm pretty sure they're going to send this along, but this is a um, really, really good article um, that was presented by a Smithsonian Magazine that says, look, we're done debating this fish feel pain. And it came out like last year. I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's a done deal. So the verdict on pain for me is that all animals are built with the same machinery to feel it. So like we're done, right? Let's move on to what it looks like. Okay. Why is decreasing pain really, really important? Okay. I have my, my technician in the audience. I have a number of technicians that I work with. Let me tell you. Reptile walks in, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Like I get so excited, it brings me right back to when I was a kid because those are the animals that I grew up with. So they're natural to me. They're like, they make me very happy. And usually they can pick up on that and they start hugging me. It is a good time. <laughs> Reptile, you'd be surprised, I'm pretty affectionate. You'll see in these videos with my patients. But why it's important to treat pain, and I know it's gonna be really frustrating sometimes because like if you have your pet, you bring them to us, we're like, these are all the things. We need to treat the things. And sometimes you may or may not be aware that the animal's painful. And I always tell the owner, like, hey, look, if this were, like, if you were in the same situation, this is the safe time where we can, like, make some assumptions. If you had the same illness, would you be painful, yes or no? Or would you expect to be painful? Usually owner's like, yeah, but I'm worried about sedation. And I don't want to give too much. And I don't want to do these other things. And I try to tell them, like, if we don't treat pain, we're not really treating the other diseases that animal might have because pain increases the cortisol levels, so our endogenous, like our internal steroids, which makes antibiotics not work. It makes a lot of things stop working. And it really does, like say we have a cut or a wound, makes the healing process slow down a lot. And so when you see us push for pain medications, it's not like we're just trying to be like, we're not like, the human pharmaceutical industry, okay? Like we're not giving it because we get like a Benny on the side. No, we really know that that's really important to treat or the rest of the treatments for the other disease processes, we don't have a guarantee that they'll even work if we don't address pain. Does that make sense? And I know it can be challenging because some of these pain medications may or may not have a side effect profile, but we're not giving it to you in the same vein, unfortunately, what we deal with in human medicine. It's like, there's a pill for your problem, boom. Like, that's not what we're doing. We literally know if we don't treat pain, then all of these things end up being a problem as well. Then that means the animal's gonna suffer longer. That means you're gonna come back more often. You're gonna get really frustrated that the treatments that we gave aren't working. And my first question is, did you get the pain meds? And they're looking at me like, that's what you're focused on? I'm like, yep, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I need to know if the pain meds were given, okay? So the good news is that even though it can be very frustrating because they're so cryptic, it's actually not that hard to recognize pain, signs of pains in these animals. It's very, you have to know exactly what you're looking for and we're gonna go through all of that today. So to recognize pain in exotics, I tell owners to focus on these three things. You're gonna see a change in behavior first. Show of hands, who's the expert in their pet's behavior? Everybody's hand should be up. You are the expert in your pet's behavior, okay? So if something's not quite right and you can't even put your finger on it but you just know something's not quite right, like, you'll see my pupils dilate. Hmm, let's dig into that. Like, I automatically become, like, the animal therapist. I'm just like, what is it doing? It's showing, the, and, like, when an animal is showing, our animals, when they're showing you pain, that means they're not, they're feeling so bad that they can't hide it anymore. So that's another thing that's very frustrating sometimes when we're dealing with animals come in and they're now showing signs of pain. It's a little bit different than cats or dogs. Like, they're a little bit more vocal. They sometimes will be able to recognize things more quickly in them because their pain behave, they don't have a reason to hide their pain. Whereas our patients, it's like hardwired in their brain, hide the pain, hide the sickness for survival's sake. So they're already usually decompensated when we're seeing them, like they're in a situation where like, I really don't feel good by the time they're starting to show you signs that they're painful. The other thing you're gonna see is a change in mentation or like, like their mood, does that make sense? So like, 
if your rabbit usually greets you at the refrigerator door the second you get home every night because you're like carrots and romaine is happening like if that's a normal behavior and they've been doing it for six years and you come in and the rabbit's sitting next to the litter box and you could care less that you showed up that's like that's a big red flag for me i'm like something's not quite right usually for, with our patients and this is these are very broad reaching categories they'll seem quiet dull sometimes they'll get aggressive especially if they're usually have a passive disposition sometimes if they're like if they're not team people which is okay sometimes we have pets that we love through the glass that's fine i got a couple of them okay we respect each other not everything needs to be hugged you know that's a primate thing that's us but for the animals that don't need to be hugged if all of a sudden they're showing weird behavior you're like ah. so like i have a colombian tegu that's what's up She's intense. She makes the Jack Russell Terrier look calm. And we have a relationship through the glass. And I can tell you for 12 years, which is a long time to get a Tegu to live, when she even looks at me sideways, I'm like, are you sick? If she's not like giving me sass when I'm trying to give her her blueberries for blueberry slaughter, I'm like, something's not quite right, okay? Because that's a change in her behavior and the, and the fact that she's not going for food is a behavioral change. The fact that she doesn't seem like she cares that I'm there, that's a problem. The other thing is non-exploratory behavior. If you have a species like bunnies, like they should be binking in and parkouring off the side of the wall. Like it should be an excited time when you get home. And if they're not doing that and they're not exploring, if they could care less that you're there, if they could care less that something new is in the environment, those are all red flags that something might not be quite right. And then here's the most amazing part of this. We now have validated, and that's a big word for they have looked at this and scientifically proven that it is right. Grimace scales. And what that is, is essentially, especially for mammals, we're able to see what the look on their face is and be able to qualify how painful these animals are. So if you can think of like a liker scale for a person, how, on a scale from one to 10, how bad is your pain today? We actually have scales for that for rabbits, for ferrets, for rats, for mice. Okay, and they're validated. It's not a question like, oh, some people thought that's what it was. It was like, no, 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 we did all the science, we did all the math, we figured out this, this actually means and correlates to levels of pain, okay? So, if your ferret is not doing ferreting things, then something's up, and they're bad. Oh my gosh, they're so bad. I love ferrets though, they're, they're hilarious. So a grimace scale is essentially a way of measuring the intensity of certain facial expression changes to qualify pain. Where did this come from? Well, what are the other nonverbal patients we deal with? Babies. Babies can't tell you when they're painful, okay? So they validated these scales for use in babies in human medicine, and then a bunch of the lab animal people were like, well, they figured it out how to deal with nonverbal patients. Maybe we should try to see if our animals do this. And then they were like, whoops, their faces have been telling us this whole time how much pain they're in, okay? So now we've got validated um, scales for them, which is great. And these are the ones that have actually been tested for accuracy. I'm not even joking. They also have them for pigs now, uh, sheep, harbor seals. Like, it's starting to be, like, this is like, thank goodness we're taking, um, an innovative step um, to really qualify pain in a way that's really, really progressive um, and has a lot of evidence back behind it as opposed to I feel like the animal's having pain. I'm like, nope, this says on a scale from one to 10, your rabbit has pain index of seven. We gotta do something, okay? One way that we have to figure out like what's a normal behavior for a species and what's a normal behavior for that pet specifically is something you'll read if you start to look into the literature, you'll see this word ethogram pop up and that basically is a way that scientists will sit down, bunch of video, a lot of video, and they basically catalog the normal activities for that one individual, okay? Some of those behaviors are gonna be species specific, but then also some of those behaviors are gonna be unique to that individual, okay? Every time we, so you guys are the experts on this already, right? For the most part, I'd say 50-50. Sometimes, sometimes people come in with new pets they've never had before or really, really exotic pets. So 50-50, I'd say most owners are the experts on this. For us, we don't have an option. We have to be the experts on this. But then you guys control this, the environment. 
And so behaviors change the minute the environment changes. I've had so many animals come in saying, hey, Dr. Latney, I'm gonna let you kiss me on my nose, I'm gonna give you my foot so you can do my blood draw, it's gonna be great. And I, own the, I warn the owners, I'm like, you are gonna be in a lot of trouble when you get home. <laughs> I know this animal was putting on a show, I'm really sorry for all of the situation you're gonna be dealing with at home. So again, the environment changes everything. When an animal is so painful that their behavior is not changing with a change in the environment, that's a big flag, a really big flag. All right, so we're gonna break it down one by one. All right, rabbits, all day, so funny. We, have a, we had a, a guinea pig that had like hair very similar to this, all right? So rabbit mentation, what's normal? Show of hands, how many people have had pet rabbits have been, I should rephrase the question, shouldn't I? Show of hands, how many people are owned by their pet rabbit? All right, now we know we're doing a, this is a trust bubble we can share, all right? They're, they have such amazing temperaments. Um, for those of you, just so that we can try to make sure we're involving some connectivity here, we're celebrating each other's pets. Um, rabbits are hilarious. I've been trained by everyone that walks through the door. Um, I used to have a German Angora and a Dutch. That was an interesting combination. Uh, one was like Prozac by proxy. The other one was a little Jack Russell Terrier-ish. <laughs> Very athletic. Um, my Dutch liked to ping pong off the walls, wanted to be energetic, wanted me to be energetic. We wanted to play rip toys all the time. My Angora wanted to sit in my lap and just be tethered, like deal with my fur and pet me. Um, they both did binkies, parkour it. My Dutch went through three copies of Guyton, which is a really expensive veterinary textbook. <laughs> Um, so that I didn't even have it for vet school and I was studying it preemptively in undergrad. I was like, ah, oh. so destruction of things, exploring things, like there's never a rabbit in a cage, there's a rabbit in a house, you know what I mean? Like that's normal, okay? Their house is your house and that's the way it goes, not the other way around. Um, so that's normal bunny behavior, okay? Uh, they tend to be pretty food motivated for the things that they really like and they can be incredibly manipulative incredibly manipulative okay super cute by default so like all it needs to do is have the pupil dilate once and you're giving it whatever it wants it'll hop over to you tell you what it wants it's really great my rabbit would hop me to the refrigerator because I'm a stupid primate I get lost really easily um, every day every day so that's rabbit behavior 101 for those of you who don't have bunnies for those of you who do this is the trust bubble we are commiserating together okay but also there's generalized bunny behavior and then there's your rabbit's behavior, right? I have some bunnies that like to shake a leg for a piece of banana treat. Like that's really unique to that rabbit. Does that make sense? My Dutch like to rip up expensive veterinary medical books. That was very specific to my rabbit, all right? But when we're talking about signs of pain, general things you want to keep in mind is that these animals develop a hunched posture. And part of the reason of that is because usually what I like to call their shock organ is their GI tract, okay? These are horses. I'm not kidding. Their whole GI tract is literally more complicated than that of a horse. Uh, but they have the largest GI tract inside of an animal with that type of GI configuration of any other animal on the planet. So very specialized hind gut fermenters. And if anything goes wrong with that gut, like that's a lifeline. They're like, oh, I don't like it. So hunched posture is the first thing. They're not responsive. So we're not doing binkies, we're not parkouring it, we're not interested in shredding up my homework. Um, vision defects sometimes. We can have these guys sometimes have strokes, is not uncommon. And molar grinding, which is different than incisor chattering. So when these guys are chattering their incisors, sometimes they'll do this when you're petting them and they're like zoned out and they're like in a really good place. They'll chatter their two front teeth, like really big ones in the front. If you see the jaw going back and forth and they're grinding their back teeth, that's pain. Notice how those are two very subtle behaviors that could be easily confused. Does that make sense? So if you ever see grindage, that's a problem. And if they're really indifferent to you handling them, that's an issue. So this rabbit, you see the legs kicked out to the side? Oh, we're all kinds of happy, right? So this one's on a lidocaine CRI and some fentanyl because LaToya does not play games with pain, okay? They get what we get when I think they're painful. And you know what? They don't have to stay in the hospital with me 
for a really long time because we're already expediting their healing process, okay? I have some bunnies that full on do Superman. It's pretty impressive. And I send these videos to show you because I understand, like, trust me, I really understand. Like, I was the kid that got told to leave when I brought a hit by car, you know, snake to my vet. Like, I've lived through that. I know what it feels like to be turned away by the veterinary community for having a unique pet. Part of the reason I take these videos is to reassure owners that, like, we're in a different day and age, okay? We are really doing the most we can for these animals, and we have way more options. You'd be surprised at how many we have. Way more options to try to help these guys feel better quickly. The goal is to get them home quickly, obviously. But, like, sometimes when we're managing the pet, we also have to manage your anxiety. So I take these videos to let you know, like, we're really doing the best we can. Sometimes if you can't visit or if it's, like, after hours, we'll send these videos so that you know, like, this is what your pet looks like, okay? I promise we're doing the most. This is what really, really extreme pain looks like in a rabbit. Can you not see it on its face? Looks obvious to us now, right? And probably if I'd have seen it 30 years ago, I'd have been like, that animal's painful. But it really wasn't until the last 10 years that we had science to prove that this meant pain, okay? Notice you could just look at the face and know what's going on. If you're seeing this, you need to bring your pet to a hospital. Okay, you'll see in the scales, which are freely available online, by the way, um, that they usually break it down into major categories. One is orbital tightening. That's big words for the eyelids are squinted, like the eyes are like getting closed. Um, nose bulge, okay, you'll see like they retract their like whiskers back. Ear position, flat back. These guys are very much like horses in that way. They do talk to us with their ears. When they're really mad and it's flat back and they're giving you shade, I just be careful. <laughs> and then whisker changes. This scale that's also listed in the notes is 84% accurate for diagnosing pain in a rabbit. Okay? So when we say this animal's painful, I'm not guessing at it. I'm saying, no, it's painful. Like, now let's move on to how we're going to alleviate pain. All right? So if you go literally Google Scholar search rabbit grimace scale, this little nice chart will pop up, and they let you know. They're like, look, this is how you do it. This thing doesn't have any pain. This thing has a moderate amount of pain. This guy's in a bad way, okay? And they have all the explanations for what to look for um, based on the categories, okay? These are freely available online, okay? We literally have them laminated. They go with our patient anywhere in the hospital, and they're attached to the cage. So there's no question, even if you've never seen a rabbit before, you can look at this scale and be like, yeah, I don't think he's really comfortable. Maybe we should, you know, give him some more of this. Maybe we should reassess him. Maybe we're missing something, okay? We're going to move the chinchillas. Oh, my goodness. Show of hands. How many people are owned by their chinchilla at night? Okay. Okay. Female or male? Female chinchillas? Yes, they're the business, aren't they? So they're the actual dominant sex in the wild. They're usually a little bit larger. Um, and they have a unique vocabulary. They'll bark when they're pretty upset. <laughs> they'll let you know. And sometimes they'll projectile urinate at you if they're really upset that you open their cage door and they really don't want you in their homes, which is your home, but you can't convince them that it's your home, okay? <laughs> So that's Chinchilla Attitude 101. It's actually listed in their name, okay? So their name comes from a Chechen word that means silent, strong, courageous, little, woolly thing, <laughs> okay? Look at that face. Again, Chinchilla owners, am I speaking the truth? They're like, preach, okay, <laughs> all right? So that's normal mentation. And for me, that picture lets me know exactly what a, they look really cute on the outside, don't they? They look like a cartoon. This is something that does not have to have a hug relationship with you. Please be very clear. It's very misleading how cute it is because you're like, I want to hug it. It's like, no. And so it develops that face to let you know, I don't need to be touched. It's inappropriate contact, right? Red flags for these guys. These guys don't have a grimace scale yet, okay? But what we do know is no barking, hiding, avoidance, if they're hunched, they got a very similar GI tract like our bunny friends, okay? Tooth grinding, and I mean the molar stuff in the back, all right? And biting. One thing that gets missed is they're biting at their flanks. They're like, it hurts here, it hurts here. That's what they're saying to themselves in chinchilla world, but like, if we don't speak chinchilla, sometimes we miss it. You saw the eyes kind of go down. 
ever so slightly. Um, this is a female, so what should she be doing when I'm in her cage? She should come and tell me I'm not supposed to be in her cage, right? <laughs> that, was the, that was the agreement. That's the contract, all right? Look, she's like, yeah, I don't like any of this. Look at the respiratory rate. I don't like anything that's going on right there. So at the end of the day, we're a partial comparative anatomy specialist, but we're also like behavior specialists. We need to learn their behaviors very well, and they can be very, very subtle. We can be very subtle. Guinea pigs, yes. How many guinea pig owners in the audience? Yes, they're super cute. Um, I'm not gonna lie, okay, rabbit owners, cover your ears. I think between all of the small mammals, guinea pigs are the most manipulative because they negatively reinforce us with sound and they're really good at it uh they will squeal when they want something i can tell you i've been cursed out by so many guinea pigs it's scary okay young ones and especially ones that are painful they can be really nervous and jumpy but older guinea pigs are super affectionate they really usually enjoy handling they're very inquisitive they're super mellow um but it's important to remember that their stress response is to freeze and then run and hide, okay? That's their like normal how they process when something's not quite right. These guys out of all of the animals that we deal with, they're actually the most cryptic. This is the truth, is it not? <laughs> this will happen. I have, I've literally fallen, I thought it was an alarm. I fell out of the bed at six in the morning. I was babysitting my friend's um, guinea pigs because I thought like a cat got into the, like the cage or something. The squeals were so loud, like the alarm calls were so loud that I thought something was wrong. They were at the front of the cage like, you're late, where's breakfast? And I'm just like, oh my goodness. And they met me for 24 hours and already I was trained. So there's been three studies that have looked at these guys because they are extremely cryptic. But the common finding that all of the studies found was that these guys will eat no matter what. And what can be surgery? And that's what they did in these studies. And they said, even after we did surgery, these guys were eating. If they're not eating, that's a big sign that something's wrong. And by not eating, they're not on the same scale as say a cat or a dog. A cat or a dog doesn't eat for 12, 24 hours. You're like, oh, something's not quite right. These guys is a GI emergency if you see them stop eating with, within six to eight hours. Why? Because that GI tract gets really upset really quickly and they give us this amount of time to respond to it. The process is happening in their GI tract and in their bodies almost like seven times faster than ours. So like things are moving at hyperspeed, which means by the time we see them to try to help, we're, in a, we're like 12 steps behind trying to catch up. The other studies, um, just to kind of highlight what they all said was that the behaviors are very subtle. Infrequent lying down, especially if they put their leg in an abnormal leg position. That's really important to flag out for. Um, especially also if you see them like lifting their hind legs like repetitively, that could be another sign that they're very uncomfortable. Um, or if they flinch when you touch them, okay? The other thing um, that we've also seen is that when we have our hands on them and we're able to assess what's going on from a doctor perspective, the heart rate is through the roof. Surprisingly, the respiratory rate is down. Why? What's their response to stress again? They freeze. They freeze. So you would expect their respiratory rate to go up, but they're just like, I don't want to move. I don't want to get eaten. I don't want to get thrown. I don't want to be punted. Okay? And then a decrease in body weight because they're not doing what? Eating. Right. So this is a live core on a guinea pig eating a carrot. She's eating a carrot. She's got carrot stain all over her mouth. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Her heart's so big, they said, if this was a Doberman, we would have told you to euthanize it by now. That's her heart rate not moving. You see what I mean? She's eating a carrot in front of me. She's like, I'm eating. I don't qualify on your little pain scale. I'm like, are you serious? Super subtle, okay? Most recent study looks at passive behaviors versus active behaviors. Passive is just, just hanging out there. Active is just like if they go to actively eat, if they actively have to move a place in their cage. And this is the scale that they came up with. There's that big word, ethogram, again, okay? But guess what? We follow in the bouncing ball, right? We all have a common theme now. When these animals start closing their eyes and it ain't sunny, something's not quite right, all right? Rats, ooh, rat owners, yes! 
For those of you who are not familiar with pet rats, um, this is why we love them. We love them. We, we, our heart aches because they're so short-lived. They don't have a very long life expectancy. If we're lucky, we can get them to three years of age, but usually two is where we're coming into a lot of problems with them. They mirror us so much in terms of our emotional connectivity, our empathy, our social behaviors. They can eat what we eat, no joke. They can eat everything that we eat. There's a reason why they're lab animal models. There's a reason why they're so popular as lab animal models. They mirror us in a lot of ways. And the reason why a lot of people enjoy them as pets is because like, they interact with me the way a family member would interact with me. Food is love. I like that. <laughs> My family's like all mixed, and a lot of it's Italian. So like, that's great. We sit down, we have dinner together. It's great. We want cuddles. We enjoy being like, touch is a good thing, unlike like, my tegu. So like, people like their pet rats. And it's heartbreaking because like, they don't live for a very long period of time. And they get some pretty aggressive diseases. Rat red flags, vision defects, which is one thing I found a lot of owners may or may not be able to pick up on very easily. And the way you'll know your rat's having trouble seeing or balancing is that they'll hug the sides of the cage and they'll be reluctant to go into the center of an area where they don't have a border that they can touch. That lets you know that like, they don't feel comfortable because they can't see, so they like, start scaling the side of the cage. Why is that important? Because they get pituitary adenomas in their brains. It's really common. Um, I can see them on CT scans here. The good news is there's a treatment for it, okay? That's not invasive, but that means you need to pick up on that. So if it's got a brain tumor, show of hands, you think the animal has a headache, might be in pain, very painful, right? Very painful. The other thing you'll see is an increased respiratory rate. Now, for those of you who are rat owners, we know that these guys have a lot of trouble with their respiratory complex. So like they have diseases that like to cause pneumonia very often in them. And often that's why we lose them towards the later end of their life expectancy. But that's not the only reason for a rat to look like it's having an increased respiratory rate. It'll go up when they're in pain too, okay? And then decreased appetite. Anytime a rat's not eating with you, there's a problem. There's a big problem, okay? Here's the rat Germa scale, which is 92% accurate, by the way. And this is one of those rats recovering from having a pituitary adenoma. I've already started it on an oral medication that's shrinking the tumor, and it shrinks the tumor literally in 48 hours. This was the next day after I gave the treatment, and now we're able to eat. Notice she's not hugging the side of the cage. But notice, if you had to score it, look at the eyes. Look like a two, right? So like even with this moving picture, you can see like this animal's not very comfortable, okay? This is what she looked like before we started the treatment. Oh, where'd you go with your I don't area? know where I'm going. I gotta get to a wall. Oh, I gotta find a, a corner fast, it's okay? Really and that's, and she opened her eye a little bit. And she's like, right. she can't even, she doesn't even realize the wall is there, okay? So you guys are the expert on your pet's behavior, right? If you have pet rats, this is one thing to look out for, okay? Yeah. Hamsters, gerbils, and mice, and then hang in there with me. I know I'm going a little bit over, okay? All day, they're the cutest things ever. There's a three and a half year old gerbil that comes to see me. He's had a concussion, he had a contusion in his spine. He don't care, he's like, I'm here, let's go. Every time I see him, it's for a recheck because he's doing better. It's amazing, he eats, he's pretty funny. Similar signs to everything that we talked about, if I had to have you guys remember, especially looking at the eye position, hunched, okay, not eating and not moving around a lot. These guys are fun. One is a bunch of wrong pieces that Mother Nature put together. <laughs> Am I lying? No, I'm telling the truth. This is a marsupial. This thing has a pouch. It's a cloaca like a reptile and a bird. What happened? It's a mammal. <laughs> It flies, it's got a web, but it's not a bird. Like there's a lot of things going on with sugar gliders. <laughs> but then we have hedgehogs, most precious little things. I love them so much. I love them. All right. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. I think someone in the audience might know who this is. So closed eyes. Sugar gliders will bite when things hurt. Mutilation is not uncommon with them. They'll bite. So you have to be very careful. And they'll also not eat very well, and they don't want to interact with you. Like that's the biggest thing. Hedgehogs are almost as cryptic as guinea pigs. They're like, I'm gonna hide, I'm not gonna eat, okay? And you'll see these guys hiding and like avoiding social interactions with you. Ooh, show of hands, how many? Yeah, we're gonna shame you guys tonight. 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. I kid you not. Super playful, very affectionate. They are not cats. They are not dogs. They're actually more closely related to bears, okay? And I'm not even joking. Its cousin is Wolverine. No joke. It's related to otters. Like, that's that whole family of what I like to call uh, Mother Nature's assassins. <laughs> kid you not. Anyone's ever heard of a fisher? Yeah, they're about two kids, so a four-pound animal, right? Looks like a blown-up version of this. Guess what they eat in a while? Snow hares and porcupines. That's, they choose. They choose to eat porcupines. Anyone see anything wrong with that? They enjoy the kill. Like, it's a, it's a shark with fur. Let's be real. All right. <laughs> Super inquisitive and active when awake, but when they're sleeping, unrousable. So you got to be prepared for that. Like, I will slinky a ferret when it's asleep, and it won't even realize that I'm, like, doing it. All right, extremely scent motivated. 30% of this thing's brain is this olfactory bulb. It can smell what you ate four weeks ago. It can smell that there's a mouse in the corner. It's already plotting its entire family's assassination, okay? When they're sick, their eyes are closed, their snout is retracted, and they're very tired. And we have a scale for that, okay? So again, common theme, eyes are closed. Not really wanting to interact. Then we got birds, okay? For those of you who have not had me as a client yet, I'm very affectionate with my patients. They're very affectionate with me. I'm just putting it out there. Avian mentation depends, because we've got some parrot owners. We might also have people who deal with wildlife. We might also have people who have pigeons, right? So like, exactly. So like, it's out of all the taxa that we study, the avian order has the most diverse number of different species in terms of families, okay? In comparison to mammals, in comparison to reptiles, and I know I'm a zoo vet. So it's like not even a question. Birds are really complicated. So most, though, no matter whether they're wild or captive parrots, exercise their, their right for choice. They let you know real fast, OK? They're really bold on the idea of choice. That's fine. They have wings. They're the symbol of freedom. You understand what I mean? Like the idea that you're telling them what to do, of course they look at you like, are you for real? A bird. That's their autopilot. That's normal, OK? That's normal. In wildlife cases, escape and paranoia is completely normal. If they're freezing, that's a little scary. It's a little scary. Captive pet birds usually will habituate to our patterns, um, and they will demonstrate reversal learning. Um, parrots have very specific time budgets. I can get into a whole nother talk about that, but if you're not familiar with birds, you're just getting used to them, if I had to tell you to remember one thing, they seem more hyper alert than other animals. They're always like, what's getting ready to happen? Why is your face in, like your hand in my face? I'm the same way. I try to think of myself in their situation. If I'm walking down the street and some stranger just puts their hand in my face and they want to pet me or they want to pick me up, I'm like, what? Like, I would respond violently, yes? <laughs> Am I the only one? I thought this was the trust bubble. We're supposed to be able to share. <laughs> like, you don't do that. And so they very much respond the same way we would in a similar circumstances. Why? Because they have a choice. You don't touch me without my permission, is what they're thinking in their head. And then they're going to demonstrate a behavior to let you know what their choice is. And if you don't follow their behavioral cues, they're going to reinforce you, usually negatively, sometimes positively when you do something they like. Okay, But this is a snapshot of a bird's day. Okay, A lot of time talking, a lot of time being social, a lot of time being social with a lot of things. If you could imagine this is a bird in a flock, imagine living with your mom and your dad, your great grandparents, and all of their extended family members for three or four generations back. That's a flock. That's normal for them in the wild. But in captivity, there's the bird, maybe the TV, and then you. Maybe some cats and dogs, okay? Maybe some ferrets. Hopefully not ferrets or birds, because they're a little crazy sometimes. All right? They spend a lot of time doing some really high-tech stuff in their brains with discrimination. The amount of information we have on how smart they are, it's unreal. It's unreal. And then they do comfort behaviors. They start self-care. The feathers have to be pristine. You take a feather and look under the microscope at it, it's a beautiful structure. It is, oh my god, the architecture and anatomy. And like they keep each one of these things in pristine, and I do mean pristine condition. They got a lot of things to do. And then when they're not doing that, they're sleeping. Gets even better. Remember I said hyper alert? Half of their brain goes to sleep. The other half is just awake, just in case. <laughs> a predator comes, just in case some things happen. All right? So that's a bird. So that you know, 
Sometimes socialization in a hospital situation, birds respond very positively to. Why? There's lights on, there's people everywhere, there's a lot of noises going on, and most people are surprised that sometimes, especially if they need to come to a hospital, they actually start doing pretty well in the hospital. And another bird jump up and start singing to me, what? 24 hours after a stroke, I'm like, you need to calm down. I need you to relax. You had a stroke. She's like, tweet, tweet, tweet. I'm like, I know. Turn the radio off. <laughs> She's figured it out. Um, this is one of my patients that come just a wellness exam. And all of these people, with the exception of the gentleman, terrified of birds. They never handled birds before, ever before. So these are some of my students. And they want to know, like, that's mom in the background smiling because she loves this whole experience. It's like, how does the bird feel about this situation, right? This is a video mom sent from home. That's all the kisses all of the students were giving him. He's pretty happy about it. He had a very positive memory about going to the vet. I'm showing this because that happens, owners. <laughs> I know it seems impossible to fathom that. But like, literally, I have a client in the audience. I have a bird that likes me. I give her kisses, too. I give her kisses too, and they're just like, oh my God, you asked her to step up? I was like, yeah, I let her choose. I let her have a choice. That's how I talk to birds. And people are like, are you like a bird whisperer? I'm like, no. I just respect their behavior, and I give them choice. I don't always take it away from them. And so we tend to have a really good time when we're doing physical exams, okay? Speaking of stroke, pain behaviors in birds means that's the first thing that goes, I'm not paying attention anymore. I'm not being social anymore. Very subtle, these guys way, way more subtle than some of the animals we give credit for. And I just want to show you, oh, whoops, let's go back. See if I can, here we go. This is a bird that's had a stroke and also has atherosclerosis, which is unfortunately very common in them. And you can see there's a wide base stance, okay? This guy has the headache of all get out. What is he trying to do? What is he showing me he's trying to do? So I go in there and I look and I see he's cracked the seeds. He hasn't eaten the seeds. That's how cryptic they are, okay? So I tell people, if you're not sure what's going on with your bird, paper towel at the bottom of the cage and evaluate what comes down to the bottom of it every day, sometimes twice a day. Because like they, again, hardwired. If he was in the wild with his flock, his whole flock would take him out if they thought something was just not quite right with him. Look at that. All right, human primates, don't take it personally. If someone stuck their finger in a cut, I would punch them square in the face. I would not even, like, even if it were a doctor, okay? So yeah, I'm gonna be a little aggressive if I'm not feeling very well. And birds sometimes can get that way, okay? This is one recovering from head trauma. He literally got accidentally slammed in the door. Accidentally. They didn't know he was sitting on the top. All right, things happen, things happen, right? But look how small he is. What's going on here? And there it goes. Eyes are closed. Well, he's not focusing on me. He's got the food there. What has he been doing? But not eating. Okay? Reptiles. Yeah. Oh. Yes, that's my black throat monitor. Yes, that's a hug. Okay? <laughs> Just in case you guys are wondering why I love reptiles. She would wait till I got home and be like, nope, kick all of my records out of my lap and then crawl up into my lap. My ex-husband took this picture. He was just like, they're ridiculous, and he put it on Facebook. I don't even get hugs when she comes through the door. She gets it. It's adorable. Their behaviors are very specific, very much like our bird friends. Their ability, by the way, to withstand some things that we, we just could not handle it. We don't have the physiology for it. We don't have the resilience for it. Part of the reason why I love reptiles is because they are Mother Nature's literally and figuratively most greenest animal on the planet. Their energy conservation experts their design is absolutely exquisite there's a reason why they live way longer than us okay this is what a reptile thinks about our physiology <laughs> nothing you do will ever impress me all right at the same time a small child might be able to get hit by a car and be in the hospital for a week this guy got ran over by a durango and was out of the hospital in three days okay why because turtles are looking at us like, what's wrong with you guys? You put all your soft parts on the outside? Build a shell. Why would you do that? You're not set up for longevity. Turtles can deal with some stuff we can't, okay? 
But I said, hey, look, reptiles could be like the hardest ones to qualify pain. Let's ask everybody. So I did a study where I asked an expert panel of people. I asked people at the zoo. I asked people at wildlife places. I asked herpetologists. I asked veterinarians that saw at least more than six or seven reptiles a week. It's like, I want to know what you guys think pain looks like in a reptile. Because it can be really, really challenging. Like birds, we're talking about 11,000 species, right? So we can some way, somehow try to get some qualifiers. And these were all of the things, everything except the one in red, is everything the doctors, the herpetologists said, the veterinarians agreed on. Guess who pointed this out? The owners. Because I went back and asked the owners, you tell me what pain looks like in your pet. Notice that when we start to evaluate pain, there's two stories that are happening. We can evaluate it, but tell me one last time, who's the expert on your pet's behavior? That becomes a very strong point when we have to address pain. Just in case you guys are wondering, this guy's getting some acupuncture. Okay, yeah. Very, very bad back, okay? Then we have amphibians, because they matter too, all right? So these guys, very interesting. They, scud they studied their opioid receptors and their pain receptors, and then before they really qualified what was going on in us. So we know a lot about them. Um, they have normal behaviors. This is very generalized, but they're very species specific. Usually they're exploratory. Depending on what species you're dealing with, they can be hiding. Vocalizations can be a really big thing, but these guys are designed to eat. They eat. This is what they do. Pain behaviors. This is my personal frog who had T cell lymphoma. If you can't picture it, you see all this red in the skin. Closed eyes, not moving, no appetite. Scratching and moving away, okay? Fish, they matter too, okay? That's a paper. Like, that's not even like my opinion. We validated that this is what happens when these, they stop eating. We used to think maybe they like have abnormal positions in the water column, like maybe they do some weird stuff, but it's actually food consumption, just like our guinea pigs. They stop eating. The other thing is they have gills, right? That's how they breathe. We'll sometimes see a change in what we call their opercular rate, which is the equivalent of their respiratory rate. Exactly, okay? So when we start to see that, and then when they're avoiding everything, that's not good. This guy had a tumor in his eye, we took it out, then he was back at home with his best friend, the cat. Cat freaked out when we took the fish to surgery. It was, things bond, you know what I mean? So I know it's a lot of complicated stuff. And if you guys get that, you get candy at the end of this. <laughs> Look at all the payment options we have for these animals. That's a lot. So I just, at the end of this talk, I want you guys to understand, after all of this, please don't ever walk into a veterinary hospital and think that your pet does not have pain medication options. We got a lot of ways we can treat pain. Guess what? All of these have been studied in the animals I just showed you. Why? Aren't those the animals we tested it in before we started to approve it for use in people? So we got a lot of information. We do. So I always tell people, feel empowered. We got a lot of stuff that we can use, okay? Understand that it's not uncommon for us to use more than one pain medication because there's more than one type of pain, okay? We're not trying to inundate you just to be doing it. It's just like if we feel like the animal has a bunch of different types of pain. This is my buddy. He got his leg ripped off by a fox. He's like, how about you can make me a prosthetic and I'll use it. See, I told you I wasn't lying about the kisses. And then also we're going to do some laser therapy. We're going to do some acupuncture. He loves it. He lays on his back. Do this to the stump. Make this happen now. See, he's smiling. I can't even, like, make this up. That was an Amazon, you know, one of those birds that really likes to exercise choice. So if that thug is going to let me do all of these things, usually you see behaviors that let you know that they feel better. Rabbits love physical therapy here. They don't even say hi to me anymore. They go right to the eighth floor. They're like, get out of here. Move, Latney. <laughs> get these acupuncture needles and let's go, let's go. And it's funny when we talk to our, the um, acupuncturists and the physical therapists, like they say that rabbits show a lot of positive behavior associated with pain relief, like more so than cats and dogs when they get the treatments. This is where all of these pain meds work in that whole little pathway we're talking about, okay? And this is the last slide, all right? We know that pain travels, okay? We know that all of the species we deal with have the machinery to process pain. There's different types of pain. We know that our guys, unfortunately, like really like to hide things. You guys are the experts of your, your pet's behavior. 
okay? These three things we need to monitor, change in behavior, their mood, and also a change in their facial expressions. And there's tons of pain medications we can give, all right? I know I ran over, I'm really sorry, but I really appreciate your attendance. I'd be happy to take some questions. This is still the trust bubble. So thank you guys for coming tonight, I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know we're over, but we could take a couple. Okay. Just yes, hold on have. while I can. Oh, sorry. Uh, is it possible for an animal to become addicted to opioids like humans? So the question is, just because I know we're stri stri streaming live, is it possible for animals to become addicted to opioids like humans? Very interesting question. Uh, depends on the opioid, yes and no. So we definitely know, just like in people, um, when we're giving a certain medication, it can upregulate the like the actual receptors that that pain medication is designed to work on. Um, definitely, we don't see, I would say, with some of the, especially the pain medications that we have to use in birds, we don't see like a withdrawal syndrome. We don't see them preferentially wanting things. Um, that having been said, um, what's really scary on our end is usually we're seeing animals that have an acute presentation of a chronic problem which means if they're gonna have chronic pain, I want them on a pain med for a long period of time. Does that make sense? I want the animal without pain. It's not a matter of us appreciating addiction. Um, sometimes I would say I've never had it be the case ever, but if you're seeing an animal, it's hard for us to tell because their behavior's coming back. If they get used to the pain medication because they feel better, they might be coming back because they feel better, not because they specifically want that one. I'll have rabbits hop over when they know they're getting ready to get meloxicam. That's not an opioid. They're like literally papers on Komodo dragons that don't like opioids, they don't like meloxicam, but they see the acupuncture cart come by and they're walking arthritis and all to the front of the cage, they stretch out. I can't make this up, there's publications on it. And they see the, acu like literally they see the chiropractor, they show behaviors associated with knowing that's pain relief, they stretch out, they're smiling, like they get prepared for it. So I think it would be really hard for us to qualify like addiction, but I would say I would caution owners to think that they could get addicted because more often than not, they've been dealing with pain for a really long time. And sometimes those processes are permanent processes. And so it's not going to be uncommon for us to say this animal needs to be on a pain medication for longer than a week. Does that make sense? It's a really good question. Okay, hold on a So I just want to give you the mic. Uh, just curious. Yes. Uh, I have a turtle, and, and she actually died after surgery a couple, uh, several years ago. I'm so sorry to hear but, that. But, you know, she had been sick for a long time, and uh, kind of everybody knew she was in pain, but it was never, ever brought up about a pain relief situation. It was like, let's try antibiotics, let's try this, mm -hmm. but never anything to reduce the pain of this situation. So is this a new thing, particularly in turtles? That's a very good question. So the gentleman, thank you for sharing that. It's a safe space and thank you for sharing it. Um, had a pet that had passed away, it was a turtle. Um, everyone knew it was a painful situation, the disease process that it had, but pain medications really wasn't brought up as a part of the treatment protocol. Is this new, these pain medications that we know in reptiles? To be honest with you, relatively new. Um, I did that pain survey in 2010 because I had access, being a professor, to a lot of papers that said, I had that library card that said, all this stuff says they feel pain. They've done surveys with veterinarians prior to that where they said, we know the animals have pain, but we don't know which pain med to give them. Um, they do have the neural machinery. The way in which they respond to different pain medications, completely different. Turtles like tramadol. They really like mu opioids, um, morphine, but morphine can also cause the respiratory tract to go down. So like if the animal has respiratory disease and it's painful, it can be really hard for a veterinarian to make that call. Uh, when I would just say, yeah, yeah, I think honestly the, the bulk of the literature that has come out with regards to pain management in reptiles last 10 years and the people who have access to that completely different. So I'm very like very fortunate and blessed. Like I decided at a very young age I would only like really pay a very strong attention to reptiles and amphibians because what you went through, I went through a lot as a kid. Um, I was a wildlife rehabber first before I was a vet. So you have no like the amount of pain that we see in these guys when they're hit by cars, snakes too. 
a lot of these animals are in a lot of pain. And imagine me being 39 now and my telling you, yeah, in the last 10 years, veterinarians have started to figure out that these guys have the same pain processing gear and that we should start treating medications for them. Snakes don't even care about morphine, by the way. They're like, hey, it needs to be fentanyl or it's a mute point. And those studies are just now starting to come out. So the good news is there's more options. I'm so sorry for your, you know, your situation. And it's, it's agonizing, but at the same time, I've been in it myself on the receiving end as a pet owner. So, but just now know that you're empowered enough to know, like, I saw this person with funny hair and she was hilarious and she said there are pain medication options and I went online and I found all these papers. I need you to read them, <laughs> okay? That's how you push a vet to start to get progressive. Is there one reference, literature, something you can refer us to when we have someone come in for pain or for best pain best relief practice. for that yeah. species? So the question is, is there like a generalized like reference for people? Plums, like a plums for like, or, Okay, so like a formulary or something like that. Is there a catch-all book that tells you all the pain med options? Unfortunately, no. Um, every time something's written in a book, it's already antiquated because it had to go through the publishing process. And what ends up happening is myself and a lot of my colleagues are putting out papers, like no joke, four or five times a year because we're just getting that information. So I tell people um, to Google Scholar it, scholar.google.com. Pain, turtle, hit, enter. You'll get the link. You might not get the paper, but you'll get the abstract, which is basically a mini miniature summary of what the paper is about. Everyone in this room has access to that. Mix for kig. Or They'll say mix for kig in there. Yeah, it'll say it. It'll say it. You ask me, that's how I do it. Like my technicians are in the audience. How often am I using a formulary? How often am I laughing at the formulary? I'm laughing at the formulary every day because that thing doesn't update as fast as the papers that are coming out. And like, I want my patient to have the most up-to-date information, most up-to-date options. So I think um, rather than having a book, I think the exotics formulary by Carpenter is very helpful um, to have on your shelf if you're a veterinarian. But at the same time, like I try to teach more evidence-based because that thing gets old, like because it takes six months before it goes to print. How much information is coming out in six months? It's insane. I know because I've sat a bunch of board exams. I had to memorize it. <laughs> it's a lot. I stopped counting at 2,000 papers. And then I just realized I, that's my limit. I'm just going to look stuff up every time it comes in. And it's not because I don't know. It's because I know that things are changing so often. How does nutritional therapy um, play a part in all this? Oh, it's a very good question. How does nutritional therapy? So there's nutrition, and then there's nutritional therapy. So show of hands, I'm a guilty that food is love type of owner. I try really hard. My family's Italian, like I can't. Um, my tegu takes advantage of that. <laughs> my turtle takes advantage of it. So the nutrition, unfortunately, when we're seeing diseases associated with pain, especially osteoarthritis, which is actually very common in a lot of species, um, strokes, things like that, it's actually nutrition that set up the situation for me to see the disease process that I'm seeing. So on that end, it's a little, little bit frustrating. Things that um, are really high in fat in general aren't good for most species, primates included. That includes seeds. Seeds, you can squash it, make an oil. It's Crisco. So, um, but seeds taste like Snickers bars to birds. You know what I mean? And you go to the pet store, there's not a whole foods option for your pet parrot, you know what I mean? Um, and there's no FDA regulation on it. So it puts us in a catch-22 where, again, we're dealing with an acute presentation of a chronic problem. A bird comes in, it's been eating seed for 20 years. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> now I know all of the problems. Also, we have animals that are developing disease associated with senescence because we're keeping them way past their life expectancy. Rabbit owners, don't freak out. Rabbits are amazing. We can get them, I have a 14-year-old that comes to see me. They're designed to live for six months in the wild. That's why they can breed like rabbits at three months. And that's why they can get pregnant immediately after they have a baby. So now I'm keeping this animal way past like how long it was designed to live. And so we see arthritis. We see guinea pigs. They're the lab animal model for like knee arthritis and us. They studied them to figure out arthritis better than us. So, and if they're on a high fat diet or they're eating more than they should, then they develop pain. On the flip side, some of the things that could be um, nutritionally advantageous for it, still studying it. We know for a fact that we think um, very much like in most animals, omega fatty threes are gonna be really helpful, 
but the source for infl because that will straight up stop inflammation in its tracks sometimes. Um, the, infl the inflammation tracks are different in different species. Um, also, you have to be careful about the source. So I know some people that will give like flaxseed to their bunnies or like they'll give um, like fish oil because they're like, oh, that's supposed to help with your omega fatty threes. You have to be careful. Rabbits aren't supposed to eat any animal protein, right? Um, so there's a vegan formulation of that <laughs> that some owners will use. Um, I would say calcium and exercise and not having a lot of um, increased food density and calories in our pets are probably the most progressive things you can do in terms of like nutritional therapies. Thank you, wonderful talk. I have a parrot and I've tried to um, train her for a syringe mm -hmm. in the event that she might need pain medicine one day so that we wouldn't have to like towel her and all that. Yeah. I've been able to sort of desensitize her to the syringe she will reluctantly touch it if I promise her a nut. But I would like to go the next step and have her like take something out of the syringe, like drink out of water or whatever. I haven't figured out what is safe to use. What, what could you recommend that's safe that would emulate something that might actually come out of a syringe one day, medicine-wise? Yep, that's a really good question. We're training the bird to get used to a syringe for potential medication delivery in the future. Thank you, by the way, for being progressive. I have one bird owned by a vet student, but she would come and she lay on her back for me to do a blood draw. And you know what? Bird goes home. I had a great, just like we saw, I had a great experience at the vet. There was no stress. There was no towel. So thank you in advance for making our jobs less stressful. Um, fruit juice is one thing. Um, I like the naked juice or the old wallas because there's no um, additives to it. They're basically like fruit purees. You want to avoid the ones that have whey protein or like soy protein in there or anything like that. My favorite is called the Blue Machine. It's all blueberries. That's a lot of vitamin B and a lot of vitamin B12 and 6. This is great. Have that. Plus, technically, we're supposed to be eating a lot of blueberries for our cognitive function. So I'm all okay with that. And it's like it's a little sugary, but not so much that I think you need to. Like if I had to choose between that and the seed, I'd be like, please have the blueberry machine juice, please. Yes. One more I'm here all night. Okay, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you guys, again, for being open and staying late. I really appreciate it. It's um, nice to have an engaged conversation. So with um, senior rabbits, uh, is there something that we should be looking for specifically as far as behavior change goes with as they get older? Because we have one that's going into probably about senior territory right now. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, one of my technicians in the audience, she laughs because like I go through this intense ortho exam and by intense, they think they're getting a massage and I'm just like, I can feel arthritis here, I can feel muscle tension there. They think they're getting a massage. The biggest thing that I find is that this is what happens. It's not anybody's fault. It's not anything you're not doing at home. These guys are just living way longer. Their knees are usually the first thing that starts to get sore and when these guys are sending plantigrade this way, it's a 40-60. 40% of their weight is up front, 60% is in the back. My knees hurt, what am I gonna do? Push it forward a little bit. And so what I then end up palpating, and the other thing is their lower back can get arthritis. So what I start to see is that they're very, it's almost like they're in a push up. They're very reluctant to move their front arms to extend them in and out, in and out. They get decreased range of motion in their wrists and in their elbows. You don't even have to squeeze. You touch, and they're like, don't touch my bicep. Has anyone ever had a Charlie horse? Like, that's what if, like, they've got all this extra muscle tension because they're not supposed to be putting all that weight up there. I can feel the muscle tension in their back. I can feel their little patellar ligament thickened, and I can feel the arthritis in their knees before I take an x-ray. What it's going to look like for you, I don't want to hop in and out of the litter box as often. I'm not going to do as many bankies. You're not going to see me do parkour off the side of the wall. I had that rabbit where it would jump off of things to get to higher levels. Um, so you'll start to see a decrease in especially their range of motion and sometimes their activity levels. Usually in really older bunnies, the first thing I see them having trouble with is getting in and out of a litter box or if they used to be able to clear it to get onto a sofa with no problem, all of a sudden they're like, I'm not hopping up there. Forget that. You're like, eh, let's go see Mama Latin and see what happens at that point. And they usually... Like, I'm very gentle about it, but like when I say half my job is diagnosing, I'm a geriatrician, a gynecologist, and a dentist. That's Exotics Medicine 101. 
And one of the things we see is when these animals get really, really old is they have all this muscle tension. Um, and we can feel it on physical exam. And then we're able to tell you which therapies are going to help. Uh, usually we tend to start to give them a subtle pain med first, but mainly we end up having to do physical therapy and we end up teaching you how to help massage some of those areas of tension out. Very much like if you had a Charlie horse. Like I remember running in track, I got a Charlie horse. I was like, ah, and like coach wants to go and touch it. I'm like, not without a Tylenol first, okay? It's painful. <laughs> so sometimes we have to give them pain meds so that we can gain access to those areas to really work out that tension. So those are just some of the things that I would say in terms of pain, orthopedic pain is high on the list for older bunnies and that's something to look out for as they get older. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, I could listen to you all night, you're so great. So um, hopefully we can do another talk um yeah if you like this another one. time but thank you so much for coming yeah thank wonderful. you guys